Alright guys, Dominic here for Kit Guru, and today we have a very fun review. We are checking out Sapphire's RX 6900 XT Toxic Edition. So, as far as I can work out, the last time Sapphire released a Toxic card was all the way back in 2015, so it's been an almost 5 year wait. But with the 6900 XT, this is no ordinary toxic card, as instead it uses a 360mm all-in-one liquid cooler to cool the GPU. And that is definitely needed, as power for this card can hit up to 400 watts. On top of that, we have other expected features, including dual BIOS, where you can choose between a performance and quiet mode. There is also a hefty factory overclock and plenty of RGB lighting. Sapphire even claims that this is the fastest 6900 XT on the market. So let's dive in and see what this card is all about. Just before we do that though guys, I want to say if you haven't already, please do hit that subscribe button and ding that notification bell down below. It's just a really quick and easy way to help us out and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming content. Cheers! Starting off with a look at the design of the card then, I would say it's quite hard to miss the fact that there's a 360mm all-in-one liquid cooler used as part of the 6900 XT Toxic. Sapphire is using a hybrid approach for this though, so the AIO is cooling only the GPU die, and then we have an integrated heatsink with two heat pipes for the VRM and memory, and that also uses an active 12 blade 100mm fan. As for the shroud of the card, this uses a combination of aluminium and plastic in a sort of greyish silver colour, and it does feel very solid in the hand. The 100mm fan is covered by a series of vents which are definitely quite eye-catching and that large mirror finish section in the middle of the shroud is actually one of four RGB zones on the Toxic. The others include a Toxic logo on the back plate, the Sapphire logo on the side of the card and even that 100mm fan is RGB. The lighting itself is all controlled via the Trick software, but there is also an ARGB header at the end of the card if you want to control the lighting via an external device, such as your motherboard. We can also note the dimensions of this card as it measures in at 268.77 by 130.75 by 44.07 millimeters. Taken on its own, it is actually a pretty compact graphics card by modern standards but then you need to factor in the 470mm length AIO tubes as well as a 360mm radiator. So, as always, you will need to check this is going to fit in your case. Flipping the card over now, we can see a full-length metal backplate, again in the same sort of silverish grey colour as the shroud. The Toxic logo here is one of those RGB zones that we've already mentioned, and we can also note a cutout behind the GPU core. Another key feature to point out is the BIOS switch, which is positioned towards the front of the I.O. bracket. By default, the card ships using the Performance BIOS, but you can also toggle this over to the Quiet BIOS. There's even a third toggle on the BIOS, but this is simply to let you choose which BIOS mode you want to use using the Trix software. Moving on, we can also see the display outputs are standard with three DisplayPort and then one HDMI 2.1. Power connectors though, compared to reference, have had a little boost as there's an extra 6-pin, so you need two 8-pins and one 6-pin. Looking now at the all-in-one liquid cooler, this is an Acertec branded unit and it measures in at 394 by 120 by 52.48 millimeters, and that is including those fans. The sleeve tubing measures 470 millimeters long and Sapphire is using three first DO 120mm fans. These do also support RGB lighting, which is controlled via the GPU. Out of the box, the three fans are installed to the underside or the tube side of the radiator, and there is a single sleeve cable which contains the three fan cables, which runs alongside one of the AIO tubes, which keeps things nice and tidy. This fan placement definitely implies that Sapphire intended the radiator to be installed in the roof with the three fans acting as exhausts. However, depending on your setup, this may or may not work for you. In my case, I've already got a 280mm radiator in the roof, so I would have rather installed the radiator at the front with the fans acting as intakes. Thankfully, yes, you can do this. You just need to unscrew the three fans and flip them over. 
The only slight hiccup is that the cables from the fans themselves do get a little more untidy as a result. By default, all the fan cables run along the frames of the fans themselves. They've been neatly channeled that way, but you can't use those little channels if you flip the fans over. For me, this isn't really a problem at all, and I did get the radiator in the front of my case with the three fans acting as intakes. It is just something to be aware of, though, that Sapphire has made life easier if you want to install the radiator in the roof of your case. It's at this part of the review then I would usually come to disassembly and we'd take a look at the PCB and the cooling solution. However, Sapphire did ask us for this video to not disassemble the Toxic and frankly I think that's just because there aren't very many units of these in the world and they don't want us to potentially damage something when we take off the liquid cooler and the shroud etc. So while we can't look at our own footage, Sapphire did provide us with a few images of the PCB and the cooling solution, which we will go over here. First up, we can see there's a total of 18 phases making up the VRM, of which Sapphire claims 14 phases are for the GPU power delivery, and then there's two phases for the memory and two for the SOC. We can also see from another photo that Sapphire is using the Infineon XDPE132 G5D controller for the GPU VRM and then there's also an international rectifier IR35217 which is used for the memory. As for the cooling, as the all-in-one only contacts with the GPU die, Sapphire is utilizing a die-cast heatsink with two heat pipes which is used to cool the memory and the VRM and obviously there is airflow from the 100mm fan which is on the card itself. So then, it's time to move on to performance. As I alluded to, we did install this in a chassis and it's our regular GPU test system provided to us by PC Specialist. This is based around Intel's i9-10900K, which is overclocked to 5.1 GHz on all cores. That CPU is paired with the Asus ROG Maximus 12 Hero motherboard, and we also have 32GB of Corsair Vengeance DDR4 memory clocked at 3600 MHz. We're going to start off our testing with a look at the technical side of things, so noise, thermals, power, and so on. But just to explain what I've done here, obviously there are dual BIOS modes, you've got the performance and the quiet BIOS, and of course I have tested both of those. However, Sapphire does also have a feature called Toxic Boost, and this is essentially a one-click overclock designed to give you the absolute maximum performance that you can get from the Toxic 6900 XT. Enabling this is literally a one-click overclock within the Trix software, and that will boost the rated GPU clock speed up to 2660 MHz, and it will also increase the power limit to 400 watts. So naturally, I did test this mode as well. Kicking off our testing with power draw then, here we can see a small difference between the quiet and performance BIOS. The quiet BIOS hit 342 watts during our testing, while the performance BIOS drew 10 watts more. So both of those modes are actually more power hungry than the reference 6900 XT and also Gigabyte's Gaming OC model, which we reviewed a couple of weeks ago. As for Toxic Boost, that one-click overclock we mentioned, well, this pushes power draw to another level, hitting 404 watts on average, and that's an increase of over 100 watts compared to the reference card. The reason for this rather extreme power draw is that Toxic Boost pushes the GPU frequency to some serious levels. It does bounce around a little bit more than the performance BIOS as you can see from this chart, but it is clearly faster. Looking at the average numbers, our Toxic Boost ran at 2579MHz, and that's compared to 2429MHz for the performance BIOS, and then 2401 MHz for the quiet BIOS. Clearly, Toxic Boost is insanely fast, but actually, even the quiet BIOS is running 100 MHz faster than the Gigabyte Gaming OC, OC BIOS. Next up is thermals, and it's hardly a surprise here to see the Toxic offering sub 70 degree operating temperatures regardless of the BIOS used. I think we really would expect that from a 360 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler. Diving deeper, the performance BIOS gives the lowest temperatures as a result of its increased fan speed, while the quiet BIOS is the hottest running option as it significantly decreases fan speed. But even then, it didn't exceed 64 degrees. 
Toxic Boost does run hotter than the Performance Burst as a result of its increased power limit and also the fact its clock speeds are significantly higher. Thermals only tells part of the story though as now we come to noise levels. There's no doubt about it, the Quiet BIOS is impressively quiet, hitting just 38 dBA while its fan spun at 900 RPM. The performance mode is significantly louder however as the fan spin up to 1290 RPM. Toxic Boost meanwhile takes that a step further and pushes fan speed to 1410 RPM which hit 46 dBA according to our sound meter. Both performance and Toxic Boost modes are definitely quite audible and I would say Toxic Boost does make the fans overall pretty loud. We can get around that though by testing noise normalized thermals at 40 dBA. As a result of the different power targets, we don't actually get identical results from the Toxic. The Quiet BIOS has the lowest power target and therefore offers the lowest temperatures. Even Toxic Boost though with its 400 watt target hit a junction temperature of just 75 degrees, which is 12 degrees cooler than the reference 6900 XT. Of course, we would expect those temperatures to be lower considering the Toxic uses a 360mm liquid cooler, but it is still good to see that this AIO is more than a match for the GPU in its 400 watt mode. Moving on to our games testing then. Here we did all of our testing using the Toxic Boost mode, and my reasoning for that is anyone buying this sort of GPU isn't really going to want to leave any performance on the table, especially when it's as easy as a one-click overclock. I tested all 14 games from our original 6900 XT review, so we can get a good idea of how much faster the Toxic is compared to the reference design, and also how it stacks up to the RTX 3090. In this video, I'm not going to go over all of those games though, so if you do want to see every single benchmark we ran, head over to the written review on kitguru.net. Here, instead, I'm going to be focusing on a few select titles at 4K, and then we'll go over the overall performance summary at the end. Kicking off with Borderlands 3 then. This is an AMD sponsored title which uses Unreal Engine 4. This is actually one of the best case scenarios for the Toxic, as it outperforms the reference 6900 XT by 10% at 4K. That is enough of a boost to give the Toxic an 8% advantage over the RTX 3090, which isn't bad at all. Next up, we come to Control, a game which definitely favours NVIDIA hardware. Here, the Toxic managed to outperform the reference 6900 XT by 8% at 4K, but it still comes in 12% slower than the RTX 3090. It has closed the gap on NVIDIA cards significantly though, as the reference 6900 XT is 8% slower than the RTX 3080, which the Toxic is actually able to match. As for Red Dead Redemption 2, here we can see the Toxic is just 3% slower than the RTX 3090, when the reference 6900 XT is 10% slower. That means the Toxic is 5 FPS or 8% faster than AMD's reference card in this title. Not every game scales as well with increased clock speed though, and Total War Saga Troy is actually the game where the 6900 XT performs at its worst, relatively speaking, when compared to the RTX 3090. The Toxic is 15% slower than Nvidia's flagship in this game, and it comes in just 4% faster than the reference 6900 XT, which really does show that increased clock speed doesn't always net you big gains. Finally, we come to Watch Dogs Legion. Here, the Toxic comes in 7% faster than the reference card, but it is still slower than the RTX 3090 by 5%. The reference 6900 XT, though, is 11% slower at 4K, so it is helping to close the gap. Across all the games we tested then, the Toxic 6900 XT is on average 8% faster than the reference card when testing at 4K, and looking at 1440p, the difference is 7%. This explains why the Toxic has really closed the gap on the RTX 3090. In my original reference 6900 XT review, we found that GPU is on average 10% slower than the RTX 3090, but with the Toxic, 
the difference is now just 3%, which in my opinion is a small enough difference to really not matter at all. We can also see that the Toxic 6900 XT is able to run out as a much more convincing winner against the RTX 3080, when the reference model was just 2% faster on average at 4K, the Toxic is now 11% faster at 4K. The last area I want to touch on then is manual overclocking, and here we honestly had very limited gains. Toxic Boost already pushes the GPU core to 2660 MHz, and it pushes the memory to 2100 MHz. On top of that, I was really able only to add an extra 40 MHz to the GPU core, and an extra 20 MHz to the memory. As you might expect, this really didn't make much of a difference. In F1 2020, we only saw a 2 FPS boost, while in Watch Dogs Legion and Gears 5, it resulted in a difference of a single frame. Power Draw didn't really change either, with a negligible 2 watt difference. Sapphire has clearly tweaked Toxic Boost pretty aggressively, I would say, as I was unable to extract anything more from the GPU. So then, it is time to wrap up. In my view, the Sapphire Toxic RX 6900 XT is a really impressive card. By significantly boosting the power limit, Sapphire has allowed the GPU to run 350 MHz faster than the reference card. That results in gains of up to 11% in the games we tested, but on average, the difference is 8%. For an air-cooled card, that 400 watt power limit would pose a significant problem, but strap a 360mm all-in-one to the GPU, and we didn't see temperatures exceed 64 degrees. From a technical perspective, it is really impressive what Sapphire has done with this GPU. The main competitor to the Toxic is obviously the RTX 3090, and I do think for many people, an air-cooled 3090 could be a better all-round option, as you're going to get the same sort of performance, but in an easier package. The thing I would say in response to that line of thinking, though, is the Toxic is clearly not really aimed at your average, everyday consumer. Personally, I think if you have to be interested in this card, you're really going to be a sort of serious overclocker, a pretty hardcore enthusiast who wants to extract every last megahertz from your GPU. And if you're that kind of buyer, you can have a lot of fun with a liquid cooled card like this, especially considering the 400 watt power limit. In terms of pricing now, Sapphire told us that the UK MSRP is going to be £1,299. That is clearly a lot more than the reference MSRP of £899, but considering the fact that the Nitro Plus 6900 XT is actually listed online for £1,399, I would say when stock actually lands of the Toxic, it's probably going to be priced closer to £2,000 than it is to the £1,299 MSRP. When we're talking those kind of prices, like I said, an air-cooled 3090 could be an easier option for anyone who just wants something fast. But if you don't want easy, if you want a project, if you want something to tune and tweak over weeks, days, even months, I do really like the Toxic 6900 XT. I had a lot of fun testing it, trying to extract every last drop from the GPU. So if you're that kind of buyer, this gets a thumbs up from me. It is technically a really impressive card. Anyway guys, that is going to do it for this video. Please do leave me a comment down below. I'd really like to hear what you guys think of this 360mm liquid cooled GPU and if any of you would be considering buying one. You can also subscribe if you haven't already. Ding that notification bell so you don't miss any upcoming reviews. And there's even a link to our Discord server in the description. While you're there, why not check out some of our merch and you can even consider backing us on Patreon, where you can see some of our content early and get access to exclusive giveaways. Until then though guys, I'm Dominic for Kit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.